It's the best scene in any action flick that's set during the Age of Sail. The good guys are cruising along somewhere when suddenly, oh, an enemy spotted just off the port larby, mahoy, matey, or something. Beat to quarters, the officer cries, and the whole ship explodes with activity, battening things down, clearing bulkheads, throwing stuff overboard, and rolling out guns. It's all excitement, it's all glory and terror as the guns blaze away, deafening broadside after broadside, before ultimately, just a few moments after it all began, the action is concluded and the audience is finally allowed to breathe a sigh of relief. Now don't get me wrong, despite my facetious description, Master and Commander is among the most authentic portrayals of the time period that I've ever seen, and it's one of my favorite films of all time. It does a genuinely amazing job at portraying many elements of naval warfare, especially in its material conditions, uh, with an, you know, an incredible set pieces, um, the, the incredible effects, the sound design, all that stuff. But there is something that it, and pretty much every piece of content that's set during the time period, from, you know, Hornblower up to, um, I, I can't really think of anything else that's actually good, but all of them, good or bad, they miss an element of naval life, even of naval battles themselves, which is absolutely vital to a fully authentic impression of the times. And that is mind-numbing boredom, of those moments before the guns start firing, waiting for the ships to actually make contact. The hurry up and wait factor, which has always dominated military life. And one particularly striking example of such dull boredom can actually be found in one of the most interesting and perhaps exciting naval battles of all time, the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, coming into this video, I'll assume that you already know the context behind this battle, so I won't bore you with the exact history other than the British fleet fighting an allied Franco-Spanish force in 1805. The British were outnumbered, but far more experienced, and going into the battle, pretty much everyone had the feeling uh, that the outcome would be in Britannia's favor. If you'd like to learn about how that was the case and, and why this battle was so important, well then I'd recommend a documentary titled Trafalgar, The Greatest Naval Battle in History, which goes over all of that context in great detail and which you can view today with this video sponsor Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a completely ad-free platform that offers over 3,000 documentaries, including a ton on military history, with more being added every week. And when you follow my link in the description, you'll get a month-long free trial so that you can watch Trafalgar and plenty of other amazing pieces besides right away. And in particular, I think you'll enjoy the Trafalgar documentary's emphasis on computer graphics and actors to portray in better living detail exactly what's being discussed by the historians on screen. So if you feel like you need to learn more about the battle itself, either before or after watching this video, then you can go and check it out there. And thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. So what exactly am I referring to when I say boredom? Well, in a lot of films and other media, whether it's, you know, through plot purposes like the fog in Master and Commander, uh, or with time skips maybe, or even if it's just through outright inaccuracy, we don't generally get to see a lot of build-up before the big naval battles. They happen pretty suddenly, sometimes even by complete surprise. Now, some ships are pretty fast moving, yes, and uh, they're pretty quiet too, without any you know big motors propelling them or anything like that. And you could have, yeah, like bad weather, uh, even a case maybe of one ship disguising itself. Like these are all the things that Master and Commander uses to, you know, have these situations happen very suddenly. Sort of like that, you know, um, jump scare effect almost with the guns going off in the, in the mist and everything. I'm not saying that it's inaccurate. I'm just saying that far more often than not, regardless of the, the conditions and such, that isn't what the general image is going to look like. And instead, that there would typically be multiple hours, even days, when individuals know that they're gonna be getting into a scrap, but in which they could do little more than just hang around and wait for it to happen. Let me explain what I mean. Obviously, the size of different ships is gonna vary a lot, but say you have a main mast that's around 200 feet tall, or 60 meters tall. Uh, for a Napoleonic-era warship, that's, that's pretty reasonable. Now, at that height, 
Assuming that a lookout's view is totally unobstructed, they could see out to a radius on the open ocean of 17 miles, 27 kilometers. That 17 miles, then, represents the greatest possible range at which the ship might both communicate with allies and, of course, spot enemies. And if the ship was trying to close that distance, even under perfect conditions, it's still going to take them a number of hours to do so. And, of course, conditions are never perfect at sea. The wind and ocean conditions may be fighting against you. The target, of course, might be moving away from you. So even for a very fast-moving, you know, commerce raider, like a light frigate or something, the act of actually catching up to another vessel that's aware of your presence and is trying to escape from you, it could potentially take hours, days, even longer. And all that while, you could have that terrible tension, that knowledge, knowing what's about to come, building up to an almost crippling level, as it often was. These were often not fast engagements. They were long, drawn-out, anxiety-inducing affairs. Slow and deadly competitions in the arithmetic and the calculus that was used to determine the ship's precise course and angle of attack, without which, of course, no amount of gunnery practice or sharpshooting would be able to save the ship. This is a very technical, a very scientific service. And Trafalgar, as much as we always hear about its action, was actually one of the greatest examples of this horrible, anxious boredom. Now, all the information that I'm presenting in this video comes from two amazing sources, uh, both of which you can find linked in the description below and on the recommended reading uh, section of my website. Uh, first, we have Trafalgar, The Nelson Touch by David Howarth. It's actually my first introduction to the Napoleonic era many, many years ago. And then we have uh, Voices from the Battle of Trafalgar by Peter Warwick, which is an excellent collection of primary accounts from the battle itself and the things leading up to it, the aftermath, all that stuff. Um, I've also gone ahead, uh, as usual, and provided a number of um, primary sources as free PDFs on, again, my website's library section, uh, if you'd like to read more, learn more about anything that you've learned here today. Now, in the build-up tra to Trafalgar itself, Life at sea was hardly the most exciting thing. Sure, there were a number of battles, you know, big and small engagements throughout the Napoleonic Wars, but the Royal Navy was massive, and by this time in 1805, had been maintaining a blockade over pretty much the entirety of Europe, including at Cadiz, where the British had bottled up that Franco-Spanish fleet, and blockade duty is dull. Whatever heroic feeling the British sailors had started with, the years at sea, cruising endlessly off the enemy ports, cut off from the rest of the world, had worn it down. They had gone to sea to fight, but the enemy would not fight. Blockading had been a dreary anti-climax, and did not seem to them a great achievement. That morning off Cadiz, they had almost forgotten why they had to beat the French, down there in the south of Spain, so far from home. They had a vague hope of glory and a definite hope of prize money, and they passionately wanted a victory which would lead to peace. But peace, to most of them, no longer meant anything so grand as the freedom of England or the safety of their families. It mainly meant the end of a boring duty. The senior officers still had the real objective in mind, but even they were sick of cruising. Nelson had had enough of it and told the Prime Minister so. Admiral Collingwood was worn out by it, and longed to go ashore and settle down. And so did every captain whose letters have been preserved. And down on the gun decks, among the inarticulate men, for whom one sea, one day, or one coast was exactly like any other, the boredom must have been even more profound. They wanted to fight because they wanted to get it over and go home. A few hours' bloody battle seemed far more attractive than another winter at sea. And you'll find a pretty succinct summary, I think, of that same sentiment in some words of the famous Royal Navy march, Hearts of Oak. The build-up was so intense that on the morning of October 21st, 1805, when the Allied Franco-Spanish fleet was finally sighted by the British, it was a moment of elation for them. Less so for the Bonapartists, but we don't have to 
get into all that. Uh, Lieutenant Paul Nichols of HMS Belle Isle, for example, would write, I was awakened by the cheers of the crew and by their rushing up the hatchways to get a glimpse of the hostile fleet. The delight manifested, exceeding anything I ever witnessed, surpassing even those gratulations when our native cliffs are descried after a long period of distant service. On those ships with bands, which were paid for privately by the captains, they struck up patriotic tunes like Rule Britannia, God Save the King, and Britons Strike Home. On one ship, the Redoubtable, their captain even carried out the morning inspection while being preceded by a uh, procession of fifes and drummers. Sailors were dancing hornpipes, and because the ships were so close in formation, their officers could even use speaking trumpets to shout words of encouragement back and forth to each other, like, oh, we're gonna go get them, we're gonna win prizes, and it'll be fun, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but there wasn't too much time for idleness in that very, very early morning, for soon after that initial sighting, Nelson would give the fleet orders to beat to quarters and prepare for battle. That rhymed. I didn't realize it was going to when I was writing this script. Enthusiastically, they cleared the decks for action. In some ships, the enthusiasm was almost excessive at such a distance from the enemy. Everything that was in the way went into the sea. But most sailors delight in any excuse to heave things overboard. The Belle Isle recorded it all in her log, which you can see listed off there. The initial sighting was made at 6 in the morning, at which point the Victory's log reports that the enemy being 10 or 12 miles distant. And during the approach, the fastest speed which Victory would report, although she was typically moving much slower than this, was three knots, which translates roughly to three and a half miles or five and a half kilometers every hour. And the enemy was also moving. It was a moving target. On that calm, gentle morning in which the breeze was nice and light, it would take roughly six hours for the closest ships to reach the enemy. Just imagine all, all that excitement, all that sudden activity after weeks of, of, of buildup, of just waiting around, of nothing. You rush into your action stations, the guns are run out, you're ready for the fight. And then, nothing. And, th and then you just get to sit there. You just get to wait for six hours. That's exactly what happened. Sure, yes, there were some like limited maneuvers and activities to be done about the ship, but for the most part, the British fleet had already been in formation from the night before. And most of the men who weren't up in the rigging, they're gonna be at the guns below the decks. Well, they're on their active action stations, they're, they're good to go. There's nothing much else to do. Although uh, the Allied fleet, the Franco-Spanish, they had a bit of a tougher time of things. They, they, again, like I said, they were in complete disarray. So they actually had to spend a couple of hours before the battle just reforming the line in order to get it ready for everything. Now, why get the men ready so early? You know, why clear for action six hours beforehand? Well, like I said, hurry up and wait. When you know that you're gonna enter into an engagement, it's better to have the men be prepared as early as possible, and then if there are any issues to be dealt with, well, then you have plenty of time to spare. It's also much easier to keep men at their stations, uh, making sure that they're all, you know, good, ready to go and everything, than to let them wandering around the decks idly, because otherwise, if they weren't at their action stations, they'd all just be sort of standing up on the deck gawking at the enemy fleet, and that might allow for some, you know, uh, unnecessary, you know, negative thoughts and such. Whereas if they're at their action stations, at least theoretically, they could be preparing something or other. Although, again, six hours is definitely a very long time for such preparations. Uh, and it isn't quite, yeah, it isn't like the men were just, you know, sitting absolutely still. There was a few, there, there were a few things that they could be doing. There was always something to be done, but the point is that there wasn't anything like deeply significant for them to do outside of these little idle preparations or entertainment, which are mainly, if anything, just to wear away the time. Uh, Second Lieutenant Samuel Burden Ellis on board the Ajax would describe one such scene. The men were variously occupied. Some were sharpening their cutlasses, others polishing the guns as though an inspection was about to take place instead of mortal combat, whilst Three or four, as if in mere bravado, were dancing a hornpipe. But all seemed deeply anxious to come to close quarters with the enemy. Occasionally, they would look out of the ports and speculate as to the various ships of the enemy, 
many of which on former occasions had been engaged by our vessels. Keeping in mind, however, that most of the men probably wouldn't have been able to see the enemy fleet, at least not very well, uh, based on their perspective, sort of the angle of approach and where they're able to look out, um, out to the ocean. Uh, some men weren't even by gun ports at all. They would just have to sit, you know, down the lower decks in the darkness, just waiting. At dawn, there was the confidence on one side and the lack of it on the other. Not many great battles have been fought in which one side, the outnumbered side, was perfectly sure it would win and the other was almost sure it would lose. Then, all through the forenoon, everyone waited with nothing to do while the British fleet crept down on its enemy and the French and Spaniards helplessly maneuvered in the ocean swell and the meager wind. There was plenty of time, then, six hours, for every man to think over his secret fear and weigh it against the thought of what he was fighting for. By 9 a.m., the fleets were roughly five miles apart. By 11 a.m., three miles, and finally, individual ships at that distance could begin to be identified and marked out, um, you know, so the men would be able to tell who'd be fighting who uh, when the lines finally met. Another account of this waiting time would come from William Robinson of HMS Revenge. Some would be offering a guinea for a glass of grog, whilst others were making a sort of mutual verbal will, such as, If one of Johnny Crapeau's shots knocks my head off, you will take all my effects, and if you are killed and I am not, why I shall have yours. And this was generally agreed to. During this momentous preparation, the human mind had ample time for meditation and conjecture for it was evident that the fate of England rested on this battle. Another great account I'd like to present for your consideration didn't actually come from Trafalgar, but was written about a different engagement three years later. Uh, still, these words by Charles Rhys Pemberton seem like an excellent approximation of what so many of these men must have been feeling. Every man and boy was mute as he stood at his station. Here and there might be seen one drawing the knot of his handkerchief girt round his loins, or that of his head bandages, all grim in lip and glistening eye. But don't you imagine, reader, that I was not frightened in all this. Faith, there was something in the orderly stillness of lying there for half an hour with all this preparation for destruction and death that made me think there might be worse places on the counting house after all. There was no noise, no laugh, no show of hilarity. Yet there was some interjectional jesting bandied about which called upon grim smiles, but no laugh. Men, shirtless, with handkerchiefs bandaged tightly around their loins and heads, stood with naked brawny arms folded on their hairy and heaving chests, looking pale and stern, but still hushed, or glancing with a hot eye through the ports. I felt a difficulty in swallowing. Now if we had gone at it at once, without this chilling prelude, why, well, I dare say, I should have known very little about the thing which we call fear. Any good naval officer could tell you that idleness among the hands is a nasty thing. And yet in certain moments like this, there seems to have been little choice to avoid it. Ultimately, regardless of what little distraction the men might be afforded, and certainly I imagine they were given as many distractions as were realistic, still, those long hours of just waiting, anticipating, knowing what's about to occur, even if a crew is sure of success, a veteran crew experienced and everything, no victory is ever without its cost. And every man must, in those six hours, I can't emphasize that enough, have contemplated the odds that his name would wind up on the butcher's bill. So ultimately, regardless of how fast you're firing your guns, how good you are at your job, how many scraps you've been through, isn't it up to chance if the enemy's shot happens to just go through right where you're standing? Now, again, on the topic of distractions, one such attempted distraction would come in the form of food. Uh, after all, as the day wore on, the men needed to eat. Wouldn't do much good to send them into battle, weakened by hunger, fatigued and everything. Uh, now, some captains had meals prepared in advance, uh, while others didn't plan as well and um, had ordered, uh, had quickly ordered up some, you know, simple meals of like cheese and bread and whatnot from the hold. Uh, for many of these men, their last meals would be had standing and sitting at their stations. And officers would eat standing up in their own stations or 
you know, if they could, maybe grouped around rudder heads as rudimentary tables. And of course there was encouragement, like the aforementioned bands and the dancing and such. Uh, and it was finally at 11.35 that Lord Nelson ran up the signal, which would inspire generations of Britons to glorious deeds. Mr. Pascoe, I will now amuse the fleet with the signal. Mr. Pascoe, I wish to say to the fleet, England confides that every man will do his duty. You must be quick, for I have one more to follow, which is for close action. The Lordship will permit me to substitute expects for confides. It will be sooner completed. That will do. Make it directly. Well, for the most part, at least. Certainly the signal was met with a great deal of excitement, and mostly it served its purpose well. Yet it was not received with unanimous joy in the fleet. Collingwood, seeing the flag, said, I wish Nelson would stop signaling. We know well enough what to do. But when the whole signal was read to him, he approved it cordially enough. In the Euryalus, nobody bothered to repeat it to the crew, and in the Ajax, the officer who was sent to read it on the gun decks heard sailors muttering, Do my duty. I've always done my duty, haven't you, Jack? And in that, I think we might see some of that frustration, some of that tension which the men must surely have felt. After all, they were told this message, which actually was originally meant to read as Nelson confides rather than England expects, which is arguably more personal and would have meant a bit more to the men, because it didn't so much imply like an obligation of like, this is what you're expected to do as if they maybe wouldn't otherwise without being reminded. It, it inspired more of like a confidence, like, hey, your commander knows that you're gonna do your duty and like he's, he's confident in, in your skill and everything. But in any case, however the message was interpreted, interpreted, it was only told to them after some five and a half hours of approaching the enemy. At long last, at roughly 11.50 a.m., the first shots of the battle were fired by a French ship, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, uh, as it fired a full broadside against the royal sovereign standing a thousand yards distant. Soon enough, she was followed by uh, the other ships all around her, and within 10 minutes, the Sovereign was taking continual fire from hundreds of enemy cannon. The Royal Sovereign, of course, given the uh, angle of Nelson's approach and everything, of Nelson's plan, the Nelson touch, haha, uh, she was unable to return that fire, uh, although she did fire some of her cannon to uh, create a smoke screen, uh, which would hopefully obscure herself as a target, since the wind was blowing towards the Allied fleet and would hopefully obscure the approach. Thus would begin perhaps the most difficult waiting period of all, because the Royal Sovereign would have to undergo this fire for roughly 20 minutes until she broke through the enemy line, when finally she could begin to engage the enemy with effect. And it was the same situation on the Victory, which only closed the gap around 40 or 50 minutes after the Royal Sovereign did. Which also brings us to the other part of this horrible waiting game. That, you know, sure, for the ships that were first into combat, it was six grueling hours of sailing and waiting, with a half hour or so of actively being fired on to top it all off. But then, what about the ships that were further to the rear? For all of them, it would take even longer to actually get into position and get started with the fighting themselves. The British fleet had 27 ships of the line, and the Franco-Spanish fleet had 33 of them. The Allied fleet from front to back was five miles long. If the Neptuno was having a picnic in Kensington Gardens, the San Juan would be taking a tour at the Tower of London. That's the scale we're talking about here. Now, admittedly, this was partially because the Franco-Spanish fleet was in a bit of disarray from the night before, and with a, a proper interval of 180 meters, if they had maintained that between each ship, well then, they would have been closer to around four miles long. But even still, that's a very long distance! And we're looking at a similar scale for the British as well. So even after the battle had begun in earnest, especially on the Franco-Spanish side, thousands of these men would still just be sitting in their ships, watching from whatever limited views that they might have, as these massive clouds of smoke were forming miles away in the distance, from hundreds of cannon and muskets being shot at very close range. Eventually, they wouldn't even be able to ships that were fighting at all. They would just see the plumes of flame lighting through the clouds, silhouetting the masts of ships. And all that's to say nothing of the terrible sounds. 
and they were witnessing and hearing all that while knowing that they were both powerless to help their allies until they reached them in who knows how long, and that they as well would soon enough be engulfed in those same hellish conditions. The battle would carry on until around 415, 430, when the victory's log stated that the final shots had been fired around the same time as Nelson's death. Ten and a half hours after the initial sighting of the enemy, which of course had itself followed days and days of chasing after the Franco-Spanish fleet and maneuvering trying to catch up with them in the open. That wasn't the end of it all, either. There were still prizes to be taken, thousands of wounded to be cared for, and of course intensive emergency repairs on all the ships, uh, plus a little detail of an impending storm which is going to cause yet further damage, including getting rid of, like, most of those prizes. Kind of a disappointment after such a big battle and everything. But at the least, at least the worst part of it all, the waiting, the idleness, the boredom, at least that was finally over. And that, I think, is an element to these naval engagements that is both regularly neglected, for obvious reasons, it's not exciting, it's boring, and yet is also vitally important to understanding the social dynamic of life at sea during the long 18th century. And, and, and to be fair, probably the social dynamic of just like military life in general across all of history. And if any of you, dear viewers, who have served or who are currently serving uh, have any examples of such horrible, terrible boredom where maybe the movies would only show the excitement and the drama, well, I'd like to hear that. I think it's interesting to see these parallels in service, uh, you know, across times. Um, so uh, I'd love to hear from you. After all, the comments are always going to serve to boost me in that almighty algorithm, so I should encourage them. I don't think I was supposed to read that note out loud. Anyways, thank you all so very much for watching, and make sure to go watch that documentary about Trafalgar on Magellan TV. Uh, not only will you enjoy it, I think you'll learn something new from it, and some interesting things in there, uh, but it'll also of course help to convince the company to re-up with me, and I really like working with them. Uh, of course, a most hearty thank you as well to the channel's devoted and spectacularly handsome, might I say, uh, band of supporters on Patreon, because without them, not only would I not be able to do what I do, but you wouldn't have been able to see this wonderful video, because without them, it wouldn't have been made. If you're interested in helping to support my work and joining their illustrious legions, you can find out more in the description down below, or by visiting nativeoak.org slash support. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.